2000, only 38% of students at Hodgson School in Lancashire managed grades A star to C in their science GCSEs. And these low grades were reflected in a poor Ofsted report. Seven years on, an astonishing 98% of students achieved A star to C in their science GCSEs. So what did Hodgson do to make this vast improvement possible? We decided to look at our courses, to look at the way in which they are taught, the teaching styles involved in the courses and the way in which they were assessed. To meet the different needs and abilities of their students, the school decided to offer them three options. BTEC, dual award and triple award science. Although only dual award and triple award science require students to sit exams, all the courses are modular and are therefore continually assessed. If you're on the right course for you that suits the way in which you learn and the assessment that allows you to show what you can do rather than measures what you can't do, you're going to achieve much better. I know full well that I can't really do exams because it slightly shows in my other subjects. Because you can ask for help as well in coursework. You can try and get like guidelines on how to do it, whereas you can't, if you're stuck in an exam, you can't, you can't ask for, put your hand up and ask for help, could you? Yeah. Because I'm not doing the triple award, there's less pressure on me and I'm more motivated to do well because I feel that if I was in set one, I'd have too much pressure on me with my other GCSEs and I wouldn't be doing as well because I'd feel the pressure. But because I'm doing the double, I've got more incentive to do well. Yeah, double award is in my comfort zone, but I am still motivated to get those high grades like the A's and the A stars. But the added pressure isn't there from the triple award. I'm happy doing three separate sciences because it means we get a real representation of how we're doing in each subject. Right, thank you everybody. Um, can we write down the learning objective to understand and explain the electrolysis of solution? Now this follows on from what we were doing yesterday when we were electrolyzing copper chloride. Wait till you see what happens to these before you actually try writing the equations because it does something unusual that you wouldn't be expecting. Right, are you ready for this for five minutes? Yeah. I'm better at physics and chemistry than I am at biology, and so doing the separate means that my biology grade won't bring the other two down and I get a good representation of where I am in all subjects, not just up overall. I'm thinking about going into medicine or into research, so it really helps that I'll get the separate grades in chemistry and biology in particular, instead of just having the overall grades for the double award. Yeah, more particles of coffee. Changing the syllabus also had the knock-on effect of changing the way students were taught. We make it very clear to the students before they start a piece of work what we're going to assess them on when they finish that work and what it is they have to put in that work to get the marks and that allows the students to achieve. It sounds really simple but we simply didn't do that in the good old days. Today's lesson objectives to be able to describe and explain the process of photosynthesis and everything that the plant cell requires to list the limiting factors of photosynthesis and be able to explain each. The outcomes for today to get a pass skill you must describe the chemical process of photosynthesis and list all the requirements that that plant cell needs in order to photosynthesize. There is some extension work for the merit work, that's to explain the limiting factors, what might stop that. And towards the end, we're going to assess each other's work. You're going to look at the grading criteria and you're going to mark each other's work. Would you give your partner's work a pass? Would you give it a merit? Did they give me all the pass criteria, what was missing, if we didn't quite make a pass? Did we make a start on the merit? Did we get it finished? You can't get the merit unless you get the pass, of course. So you need to meet every single requirement in order to gain a merit skill.
So, sharing the grading criteria not only helps students to help themselves, but also to help each other. You've done really well with the backgrounds and you've included everything about photosynthesis and the word equation. You just need to do the symbol equation at the end for a pass. And you can talk to each other about what we need to do and it helps everybody sort out what they need to do to get up to the next grade and to better themselves. It's not like, hi, you're failing and I'm passing. It's all like, you need to do this and then you can pass and you can be like the rest of us yeah. and help each other. The new courses can also accommodate different learning styles. Saving future generations. Humans over the years have caused many species of animals to become extinct. In science these days, you will see drama, you will see the use of video, you will see the use of podcasting, and you will see an awful lot of exciting practical work going on. One. Two, three. A rainforest tree has just died, been destroyed. We need to think about the wrongs we are doing and take action now. Remember, no to extinction, yes to redemption. The famous lion has today died along with the witch and the wardrobe. Outbreak of ant colony kills many. But to our sub story with Ben, who has just discovered two breeding Balinese tigers. <laughs> The modular nature of the courses also offered staff and students another important spin-off. The trick of all these courses is the fact that it's giving us very accurate data about how the children are doing. We wanted to know from the first term in year 10 what our likely outcomes were doing. So we did it for the staff and we thought the staff having that feedback and the staff knowing which children they needed to push harder and that would be great. But at that stage, we were still pushing the children. We were saying, your grade's not up to where it should be, you've got to work harder. And it came from the science staff. It was like one of those moments of serendipity when you discover something by chance, like penicillin. They started to use these spreadsheets in the classroom with the kids. These spreadsheets had just been used by the head of department, by myself, by other members of the department, to look at classes with teachers. But one teacher started sharing that information with the students and say, look, look, you've got C's in all of these. If you could just get that one better, or if you could just score this many marks on your next one, then you could get the C. And suddenly, instead of us pushing, nagging the children, the children were pushing us. They were saying, well, yeah, if I get two more marks, I'm at a C. How many more marks do I then need to get a B? And it turned the whole of our teaching on its head. OK. So, from here, we can see that you need to finish your DNA poster yeah. and your transcription translation PowerPoint. Is that what you're working on at the moment? I'm in the middle of the DNA. No. You're in the middle of your poster, so you're all right working through this and yeah. carrying on with yeah. that? Yeah, that's fine. Yes. OK. It's not just for individual modules that the data on students' progress is shared. Every eight weeks, boards displaying the overall picture go up in a public corridor. This means that anyone can see exactly how any student is doing in every part of their science course. OK, what we've got here is a summary sheet showing where the pupils are at and where they, what they need to do to improve and pass. It's an individual breakdown of all the different units that the students have completed. If they're all at a pass or above, you will see it come up with a P. If they're at merit or above, then it'll come up with an M. And if they've managed to reach distinction in all of them, it'll come up with a D. Unfortunately, if they haven't passed every single unit, then they'll come up with an F, so they all know that they need to improve on that unit. For most students, the board is a chance to show off their good marks, as well as a tool to motivate them further. I got a pass on a pass, and I got a pass, pass, fail, and then a pass. No. Well, where, where we, got we got merit. We got merit. I know, yeah, but we we failed that one. Let's just do that one. Makes us feel good. Good about ourselves, actually. Because you know where you are, so it, it's yeah. like, it's good. It's good to know. Like your friends can walk past and say you've, you've done well. Like you've done well this month, so it makes you proud of yourself. And then if you, do, if you are on a fatal, then like, people see to you on a fatal and it doesn't feel good to be told that you're on a fatal. So you work harder to get a pass. And knowing what everyone else on, like, gives you 
drive to work towards that yourself and improve on your own grades. And so it helps knowing what other people are on because it can help you understand what's going on around you. With the database, you can pinpoint where you've gone wrong. So in my year 10, I had three A's, one A start, a B and a C. So I could pinpoint that C was my downfall. So therefore, I'm retaking that C in March, which will boost my grades higher. So to say I get an A star instead of this C in the reset, it might boost my overall mark up to an A star. But even those on fails can take heart. They'll get all the help they need to complete the coursework and get their pass. We start with a can-do culture that the pupils are expected to achieve. We don't take failure as an option um, and that is something that comes from all teachers to all pupils that together as a team we will do whatever we can to help maximise achievement for everybody. When you work in a group as a team and you're all at slightly different subjects, mine's chemistry for example, you have to work together. You have to support other people. Possibility, isn't it? But it's... We all have our own targets for our own particular classes, but of course it doesn't work like that. We get a focus as a team on, on the work that we're going to do, and that takes us to the, uh, a collective responsibility. Every teacher knows a target for their class, and they know exactly how to enable the students to reach those targets and every child knows their target and they know how to get to that target. That leads to an ownership of the data, an ownership of the targets and because they can see how to succeed then it leads to an expectation of success. And once they expect to succeed, obviously they do succeed. My targets are passed but I'm on a merit and I've still got a few other bits to get which I could possibly get distinction on. My targets are C's in our science, for all three sciences but I'm at B's at the moment in all of them. Which, but because I'm in a set with a lot of people who are doing a lot better, like on A's and A stars, it like, that drives me to try and get with them because I don't want to be like, behind everyone else. I'm on passes and I've got a few like merits and they have like an M or a P or whatever. and um, and I've got most stems and a few P's, and obviously I want to try and get all my passes up to merit to get four B's. So, but I've tried to get it, get in distinction, but I think that's a bit too hard. <laughs> so I try my best to get merit. But according to deputy head teacher Tony Rothling, it's not just the strategies employed by the science department that are behind their improved GCSE results. None of that would have worked unless throughout the whole school we had established what we call a learning ethos. It's about our acronym, PAUSE. P for punctuality, A for attendance, U for uniform, S for safe and sensible behaviour, and E for exam success. It's about ensuring that students are in the right place at the right time, that there is a calm, orderly environment, and that everybody is here to learn.